All right, am I spotlighted for everyone? All right, cool, seeing some thumbs up. All right, uh, welcome everyone to tonight's class on uh, value sketching a crouching figure, which if you haven't figured out is uh, part two of a class from last week. I kind of made them titled as if they were standalone classes, but uh, this is a continuation of what we did last week. So if you missed uh, last week's class on uh, sketching a crouching figure, then uh, the part one can be easily found on YouTube and uh, our lovely moderator, Nicole, can drop that in the chat for you. And then the week before that was uh, basic body proportions, which would be really helpful if you are struggling uh, with getting the basic body proportions of this crouching figure. Although you'll see when you're tuning in to uh, the class from last week that I broke it down and made it as simple as possible to where you don't even necessarily have to know anything about drawing body proportions because we really just created a connect the dots uh, for ourselves using the joints of the, the human figure, thinking about it in terms of these shapes that you might see on a wooden mannequin. So uh, if you are just now joining us, then um, you know, still stick around and just, you know, do your best tonight. And then you can go back and uh, check out the first class. And I'm definitely going to be building on what we did from last week. So it might even be fun to just start from where we are tonight and jump in the deep end. And then just, you know, maybe you'll just swim uh, without having the, the scaffolding from last week. Uh, okay. And then in uh, next week's class, it will be a premium class on uh, creating a monochromatic watercolor painting of a crouching figure. So we'll be adding this, uh, combining everything that we've done in this class and last week's class and creating uh, this painting in using monochrome. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch to my tabletop view and we'll go over supplies. All of these supplies can be purchased at Michael's. And don't forget to tag your work with those hashtags, make it with Michael's or Michael's classes. You can also follow me uh, on Instagram and tag me with any posts that you make uh, with work from this class with uh, at, Hadri at Adrian Hodge Art, or you could even use the hashtag Adrian Hodge Art and um, so that people can find where, where you took the class and watch it on YouTube as well if they want, or so I can find you because sometimes it's kind of hard to find the stuff that's tagged with, make it with Michael's or Michael's classes personally because they get a little buried since there's so many people using those hashtags. Uh, I also teach private lessons and I've got some availability on my private lesson calendar right now. So uh, if you want to go to my link tree that can be found through my uh, Instagram, and it's just linktree slash uh, Adrian Hodge, and I'm pretty easy to find, and then you can just book a consultation with me, or you can just go ahead and even book a private uh, session with me if you're interested, and I've got a bunch of, um, you know, just easy forms to fill out to make that super easy. Uh, and then I'm also on Facebook, Adrian Hodge Fine Art, and here's some of my work on my business cards if you want to check out some of the other stuff that I do. Okay, so we're going to end up with something by the end of all uh, three of these classes. So next week at the end of the class, we might have something that looks like this, depending on where you are in your artistic journey. Uh, and I don't have a photo of what we're going to have at the end of tonight because I painted over it. So I don't have that uh, right in front of me, but I do have a picture of it on my phone. Oh, actually, I only have the one from last week, but you saw what it looked like with all the value added to it in the, the advertisement for the, the class tonight. So that's what we're aiming for. Okay, so we are just using the Statler uh, graphite pencils. I've got this tin with 12 pencils. You can use any graphite pencils that you have handy. 
Uh, next week, I'm going to have you use watercolor paper, the Strathmore watercolor sketchbook is what I have here, and I've got a little clip on the end of it to keep it open. But for tonight on the supply list, I just had the pencils, a synthetic eraser from Faber-Castell, and then the Canson mixed media pad. So uh, you can continue doing the watercolor even on this mixed media pad if you wanted, or you could do a little practice sketch and then maybe do it on some thicker watercolor paper, like what comes in the, the Strathmore uh, watercolor sketchbook there. So that's what will be on the supply list for last uh, sorry, next week. Okay, so this is where we ended at the end of the class last week. And like I said, we used a very step-by-step -step approach to uh, finding the, the shapes in the figure. And we were sticking to these very general shapes. So I know there's oftentimes this urge to jump ahead and start putting uh, details on a drawing so quickly. Like we'll be drawing uh, this person and instead of waiting until we have all of the proportions accurate we like go ahead and start putting their hair or their eyes or their fingertips or you know just some of those details in there and then we realize oh my goodness oh my goodness this arm is like way too long or you know these fingers are like going way over here past the knee or this knee is like way up here when it should be down here or you know whatever proportionally is off or maybe the entire figure is a little too wide you know and it needs to come in a little bit or maybe it's too long and it needs to come in a little bit but we've already got those eyelashes on there you know so like who wants to erase it and start over when we've already got eyelashes and details like that so i get it i've been there a million times but i'm telling you if you're really aiming to capture a figure that looks like a figure in real life, starting very general with these shapes and building on those is just a more likely to be successful uh, process to go with. So that's what we started with last week. And then now we're going to erase this a little bit and uh, get it ready to add the value. So if your drawing is this dark, that is gonna make it really tricky to add the watercolor to it because graphite has a tendency to, you know, bleed when we've added a little bit of water to it. If it's very heavy on there, then it might not make these lighter, more transparent areas look quite as light and transparent when we add the watercolor to them next week, if you're planning to join me for uh, that class. So just you know, keeping those lines super light is what we're looking for so that we could maybe completely erase them and just have the watercolor there with no pencil line showing. But since I'm teaching you on Zoom, I have to draw a little darker than I would. As my children's have iPad has the adorable little childish uh, screensaver on there. I don't know if y'all caught that. Uh, anyway, so I had to draw a lot darker than I would if I was just working, you know, by myself at my studio desk with this. So now I'm going to erase most of it. I'm still going to be able to see it, uh, but you might want to do the same also because we're going to build on this now and we're going to build on it based on the value. So we should still be able to see all of these shapes. Like they may disappear for you on Zoom, but I promise you I can still see them. So, and I'm doing that because, you know, we don't want all these circles on the knees and all these dark lines distracting us too much. Uh, we wanna be able to build the figure on this. So don't worry if you can't see my drawing for a bit we're going to bring it back to life using just the value tonight. Okay, so once we've double checked and made sure that all of our proportions are lined up the way that we want them according to what we're seeing in these three photographs that were provided on the supply list, then um, we're 
yeah, we're ready to, to add our value onto them. So also, I just realized as I was going over the supplies, one thing I just wanted to mention was uh, next week, if you haven't signed up for the class, the watercolor class, I just want to show you the watercolors that we're using for that class because they are so cool. You know, they're the Viviva color sheets. And I'm just going to sound like a commercial for Viviva for a second here because they come in these little sheets and they have little parchment paper or in between all of them. And we used, I say we, I, I don't know, it's not we, we are going to use, I used the Persian blue for, uh, for the watercolor example. And that's all that I used was just the Persian blue and a, a couple of paintbrushes. So we'll be doing that and you can continue on in the mixed media sketchbook or you can grab a Strathmore watercolor sketchbook like I have here. And that's what we're gonna be adding using just one color. So you can use, there's 16 colors that come in this set. You can use you know, any of these other colors. It doesn't have to be blue, but I'm partial to blue and painting monochromatic blue people is something I've done a lot of in my work. and why not share the process with you all. Okay, so we've got these three photographs that we're using and we're focusing, oops, we're focusing on the value. So the light and the dark of what we're seeing in this photograph. So I got the full color one to you, I got the black and white, and then this one where the light is inverted. So in this photograph, all of the light is showing up dark and all of the dark is showing up as light. So our model Demetrius in this photograph has a white uh, background behind him and then now it's black and the inverted one. So we can just keep thinking that as we're looking at all of this everywhere where we've got this searing white shape in the center uh, or on top of the leg or in the hair or the eyebrows, the eyes, the mustache, et cetera, all those places are where the deepest, darkest shadows are occurring and everywhere where the darker shapes are happening are where our brighter highlights are happening. So I find that it's very helpful to look at these value shapes rather than uh, looking at the eyelashes or the details or uh, any you know hard lines or outlines because the world is really not made up of hard outlines. It's made up of light. We see things based on how the light is falling on them. And the more uh, contrasting the light is, the more uh, you know, big, bold highlights happen and big, bold shadows are occurring on a subject, then the more we can really lean on those shapes of shadows and shapes of light to help us render it. And it's really a trick for you know, getting around knowing everything about anatomy or body proportions because all you really have to do is focus on what the light is doing. Okay, so I'm gonna be using a heavier pencil like a 2B as I get started here, but you would be, uh, you would do best to stick with an H pencil like we did last week and just keep everything super light. Cause remember my example uh, that I showed you or that you saw when the class was advertised, that whole thing was drawn with a nice light H pencil uh, just sitting on the surface of the paper so that everything is easy to erase. It's definitely a little more challenging for me drawing with a, a heavier pencil and putting everything down so dark when I'm still, you know, just finding my way through the drawing the same as, as you all. Okay, so as I get started here, I'm going to look at the, uh, the inverted light because I think it's really helpful. And I'm going to just go from light to dark and start to fill in these value shapes. And since I'm looking at the inverted one, I'm actually looking at the, the light shapes, but I know that those are the shadows. So right here on the side of the leg, and we outlined where you know the, the leg is over here last week. And I can still see my drawing, by the way. I know it's not showing up on the Zoom, but I can still see it quite a bit. Okay, so I'm filling in 
this shape of the shadow and it kind of looks like an open book, like the edge of an open book on its side. And I find that naming things as something other than what they are makes it really helpful to draw them. I don't know what that is. It's like the psychology behind, you know, what we name is hard or easy. And if we call it something other than what it is, for some reason, it's a little easier to draw it. So if I think about that as like a crown on its side or a thorn sticking out from a crown, et cetera, you get the idea. Okay. We actually do kind of want these three circles that we drew last week as a, a shadow here. Oops, my eraser was a little dirty and smudged that. I was rubbing this eraser on my jeans earlier to clean it and maybe that was not the best thing. I just got a deep smudge right there that doesn't want to come off. All right, but uh, I'm just turning that circle into more of an organic shape for a highlight that's gonna happen right there. So it's showing up as dark in the photograph. So that tells me that that is actually a highlight on the knee. And if any of my lines are kind of hard to see at first, just bear with me, I'll make them darker as we go along. Okay, and then I see this very organic shape right here on the rest of the knee that feels like like an old like a telephone receiver if you're old enough to know what a telephone receiver looks like doesn't seem like you would have to be that old but I know we have a lot of younger folks in these classes I used to teach middle school and I had a kid had to call his mom once on my phone in the classroom and he couldn't figure out how to hang it up because he had never held a phone receiver before. Anyway, I'm seeing a phone receiver in that shape right there on the knee. Okay, and now I'm making my way. I'm just looking at the shapes of the shadows and the shapes of the light. So I've got another interesting organic shape here coming down the arm looking for the the shape that that light is giving me there and I'm just going to bounce all around I'm going to go I think starting from the knee is a good place to start rather than starting from the the head or the face because again we're assuming that we got those proportions all down last week we've got all those body shapes all lined up in a way that's accurate to where they fall in the photograph. If we're going for a representational drawing here, maybe you want to make your figure a little abstracted. Okay, so I went ahead and put the uh, shapes that I was seeing in between the toes there because why not go ahead and do something that we all avoid those hands and feet. We'll go ahead and do them first, get them out of the way. And if you're drawing nice and lightly with an H pencil, like I said, you should be able to erase uh, all of these lines as you go. I might turn off my, that any better? Is the light any better? Just turned off my ring light. I feel like it's giving me a glare for some reason on my drawing, depending on where I move. Maybe that's just me on my Zoom. Uh, but yeah, it maybe looks a little skeletal as I'm adding some of these value shapes because they do tend to fall, like the highlights fall on the places where the bones are sticking out, right? Like the light's gonna hit our our knuckles there because that's where the elevation is, is the highest. So that's showing up as a dark spot in the inverted light photo, but I know that that means it's going to be um, a highlight later. So I'm just filling in all of those shapes 
of white that I'm seeing in the inverted photo while knowing in the back of my mind that that is a shadow. I had to think about it for a second. It's like translating. You're constantly translating whatever shape you're drawing. If you're drawing a shape of light in the inverted photograph, then you have to keep in mind that you're actually drawing the shadow. So rather than thinking about I'm drawing the side of the arm or I'm drawing uh, these shorts or the crotch or whatever, we're just looking at this big shape right here because there is some nuance uh, that we can see in the other versions of the photograph. Uh, we can see the chest and uh, the stomach a little bit and we can see the top of the uh, shorts, et cetera. But here, it's just all one big blobby shape. So we're just drawing in that big blobby shape. I see that Luke has his hand raised. Um, is there a question in the chat that? There is a question about, um, can, you, can you explain a little bit more about the, um, the outlining the value shapes and why? Okay, yeah, good question. Um, so, when we look at the world, uh, like if we're in a pitch black dark room and I light a match, all you're gonna see of me is whatever's illuminated by that match, right? We can only see what light is illuminating. So we kind of take that for granted when we're in, you know, in a space of light. It's not until we're in the dark that we're like, oh dang, I can't see anything, right? Uh, so when subjects block the light, we have a shadow, pretty basic light and dark information there, right? But when we draw human beings, when we draw anything, when we draw an apple, when we draw a chair, when we draw uh, a paintbrush, I'm just looking around the room, uh, we all have symbols in our brains for what those things might look like. And most of that is kind of like a based on outlines or contour lines maybe, but most of the time we're we're thinking about the, the symbolic like emoji symbol of that thing. So human beings don't have hard outlines around their shoulders. They don't have hard outlines around their nostrils. They don't have hard outlines around their hands or their fingertips. But when we try to draw them based on those outlines, if I try to draw this knee based on a hard outline of a knee, you might not quite know what you're looking at, right? But if I just draw it based on the light that's being cast on it, I just look at the shapes of the shadow and the shapes of the light, you're more likely to get something that looks like a knee. You're more likely to get something that looks like a foot or a hand. And it's tricky. I mean, especially on a small scale drawing in a sketchbook like this, when I was uh, filling in the shapes of shadows on this hand, it was a little tricky and got away from me. So you know, it's, it's one of the more challenging aspects of painting and drawing is if we're trying to make something look representational as it looks in the real world, then value or light and dark are one of the number one things to pay attention to. So that's what this lesson is focused on to help you draw a figure based on the value, which is the light and dark. So we're outlining the value shape so that it will be easier when we get to painting it, we'll know where to put all of our light and dark blue values. So we're kind of creating a paint by numbers for ourselves so that it'll make it super easy next week. Because otherwise, if I just like had a, a one hour class on painting this monochromatic blue crouching figure, I would probably leave a lot of people in the dark, uh, pun intended. So I'm just building on how do we get here? And the way that we get here is by outlining these shapes. And then we're gonna create our values using the watercolor. We're gonna have our dark blue, we're gonna have our medium dark, our medium blue, our lighter tints of blue, and then we'll have our absolute white and more transparent uh, blues. And then we're gonna know exactly where to put those next week in the watercolor portion of the class because we've already outlined these value shapes now. So I'm making them kind of dark in my drawing, but ideally you would be drawing these super light so that uh, it's 
very easy to erase them. Like my pencil lines are still there in that photograph. You can see them if you look very closely, but they're just very light so that they can be easily erased. Okay, so good question. Maybe there were some other folks that were also wondering why on earth are we even doing this? Uh, okay, so I'm looking for this big shape of light which is actually the big shape of shadow that's all lumped together here. And I'm really paying attention to the, the shape that is created here. And if you've got a printout of the photograph, I would recommend getting a dark pencil and just even outlining that shape so that you're only drawing that shape. And this is just a trick that I've found like when I first started drawing more realistically, this is what I was doing. And I felt like I was getting away with something. There's an Andy Warhol quote about art making that says art is anything you can get away with. And I oftentimes feel like some of what I'm doing is like a trick, a little bit of a magic trick. You're creating an optical illusion. So I'm not thinking I'm drawing Demetrius's collarbone, I'm thinking I'm drawing this boomerang shape of light, which is actually a shadow that comes up right here next to the edge of the head. And that's going to make it easier with this hand. So let's go ahead and tackle this hand. It's a tricky one. Uh, so first, if we didn't have one thing I'm noticing that maybe when I put those in last week is I didn't note the downward angle of the knuckles. So think about like four dots right here. One, two, three, four. And they're coming down at an angle like this. So like that. And then we're doing one, two, three, four down the, the knuckle there. So, but nice and light so that you're not In case you need to erase something. I'm drawing those circles back in there, but I'm, I'm making them kind of light myself. Okay, and then we'll pay attention to where the, the thumb is in relationship to the head and the face. And I'm gonna put it about right there. And then I'm going to have the shape of the light. And it's going to look kind of funny. It's going to look kind of skeletal, right? Because like I said, the light is hitting directly where, but these are highlights. So we're outlining these, uh, yeah, because it's showing up as dark black. So those are the highlights. So we don't want these like super hard circles that are going to be tricky to erase right there. Okay. And then we've got some really tricky foreshortening happening where we can see a bit of the fingers and they're creating this kind of triangular shape here on the side of the, the chin area. All right. And then honestly, I get a little lost right there because of the uh, the way the light is so blurry. So I'm going to just jump down here to the rest of the, the arm and the hand and then save in the head for last, if y'all haven't noticed. All right, so let's look at this. I'm oh, sorry, moved that up a little too high. Let's look at this highlight hey, right here. Adrian, oh. I do have a question in chat. Someone said, uh, do you use this approach only when you are doing a watercolor painting? No, I use this approach with everything. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, and if you've been with with me for all of these classes for a while, you know that you know maybe I'm like being a little more, uh, like labeling it a little more tonight. But that's just because I know this is a really tricky figure, and I'm trying to take the the pressure off of it for anybody who's intimidated by this figure in a a complicated um, 
you know, sitting position. But uh, we've done the same thing whenever we have drawn portraits of heads, you know, we've found the, the basic shapes uh, for the, the head and where the facial proportions land. And then rather than drawing the nose, we've looked at where the light is hitting the nose. When we're drawing lips, we've looked at how the light is hitting the lips. So contours and the light are the two things that I focus on the most, but, uh, and we just really don't have time for me to go into contour lines quite as much. We did a little bit last week when I talked about like cylinders and um, thinking about the roundness of the, the form. So as we're putting these value shapes on there, it's kind of built in that we're looking, you know, we're looking at an open book. And so it's curved, it's curved because it's following the contours of that cylindrical shape of the leg. Um, so without going into the contours too much, which we've done in numerous classes, uh, we're making these value shapes wrap around the three dimensions of the forms. All right, so now I'm looking at the arm right here, and there is what kind of feels like a line, but rather than drawing it as a line, I'm looking at the double-edged shape of the shadow where the arm is creased in half there. And I might have to draw this a couple of times. Maybe once I get it on there, I realize, oh, that's actually not the shape I was looking for. So looking at the shapes within the shapes is really helpful. Like we described this as a turkey leg last week. And as I look at it, I'm like, oh, it doesn't feel quite like a turkey leg. That's why I need this line to curve. Yeah, now I'm feeling the turkey leg. All right. We got a turkey leg shape. And then we drew a little circle right here, but the circle was to tell us there's a roundness happening where the, the arm is folded in half right there. That muscle kind of being sitting on top of another muscle. All right, and then this knee, we talked a lot about this last week, uh, how foreshortening is so tricky. Like we know the finger is this long, but if I point the finger directly at the camera like that, then you don't see very much of the finger. You only see the top of it. You maybe see a little bit of an indication of the side down here, but it's very steep. And so what you would draw of that would be just whatever shapes you're seeing. You would see draw a straight line and you would draw a circle at the top and a couple of straight lines on either side. And then you would use the contours to make it feel rounded. So we know we've got a whole leg right here, just like we know there's a whole finger, but the information is visibly missing. So we're not going to draw the information that we can't see. Like we can't see Demetrius's left foot. So we're just not drawing the left foot because it's not visible. If we were to squeeze in a foot over here, it would be like, where's that foot coming from? How, you know, how is the foot there? Because I don't see it right? So we're all not drawing what we can't see. So even though we know the leg distance between here and here is a lot longer than this, all we can see is these shapes. So that's all we're going to draw is these shapes. It's kind of like a crescent moon shape of light. And it's like a couple of different crescent moon shapes. And then that's really it. And they don't even need to be that dark. I'm only drawing them dark so that you can see them. And then there's a highlight right here. So we're just looking for the shapes of the shadow and the shapes of the light. Okay, and then I just realized my knee needs to come back a little bit. So if you're noticing anything like that, like I just, as I was doing that shape, I was like, that's a little long for that shape. 
And then I realized, oh yeah, I've kind of got it right in line with the fingertips and it needs to be, the knee needs to hit maybe right here on the hand. So I had mine a little long. So I'm gonna just sketch that shape again real quick. Speaking of how we're not drawing length if we can't see length, Okay, so now as I get these crescent moon shapes on there, that feels way more accurate. So don't be afraid to erase something and draw it again. I know it's really easy to just live with it. And some things it is, it's like, eh. Like I honestly did think when I just caught that, that nobody would probably notice if I just made that leg a little long. But then I thought, hmm. I noticed, and also I wouldn't have sh the space to put the shadow in here as much. So made the decision to be a good example and erase it since I could tell it was off. Okay, um, do I even have the thumb in here? I think I totally skipped over the thumb when we were drawing before. Oh, right, because I was only drawing the light and the other side of it has a little bit more, I don't know. I don't remember what I was focusing on before. Okay, we'll go ahead and put the shadow in here and we're just lumping this whole shadow together, even though there's some nuances to the shadow. If you wanna go ahead and put the nuance in the shadow, you can. Definitely will make it more interesting later when we're adding the watercolor to it. Okay, how are we doing on time? Wow, we're doing great having all this time left with the head. Okay, but then I forgot about this other shoulder over here. So again, just looking at the big dark shape, which is actually the, where the light's hitting it directly. So again, I don't wanna to draw too dark. I want my pencil line pressure to match what the light is doing. So if that's the light, then I wanna draw it nice and light. And a lot of the times it's kind of easy to add the shadows in if you have already focused on where the highlights are, like we've done. It's really easy to line up these shapes of shadows with the shapes of the light that have already been defined. All right, so now for the head. First of all, I wanna make sure that I've got, since we drew the head kind of really quickly last week, I wanna make sure that the shape of the head matches. Like the overall shape of Demetrius's head. And I'm realizing I didn't really get the like lift on the hair here. Like I think I was thinking about the top of the head as the top of the hairline which is really easy to do. So I'm just making sure I've got lots of space for the hair here. So think about where, just sketching in the shape of the hair, basically. And that's given me a better sense of where I might need to adjust the head. All right, and then I'm using the relationship between the head and the, the muscles back here, like the uh, back where we can see his hunched shoulders, the back of the shoulders there is right in line with the ear. So I'm gonna make sure all of this makes sense if I have the bottom of the earlobe just barely coming into, uh, you know, right in line with the back of the, the shoulders there. If the ear is too high up or too far down, you know, might need to adjust the entire head at this point. That's all I'm saying. All right. And then back of the hair, I'm just looking at the overall shape of the hair. All right. 
think that looks good. All right, so now this is where that vertical and horizontal line is very helpful. And I erased it, but I can still see it. But I'm just double checking it because we've got a three quarter view of the head here where we're seeing more of this side of the head than we are the right side. And then on this side of the head, we've got, you know, the neck and uh, the side of the face happening. So it's not, they're not identical. They're not symmetrical, what we can see here. So we wanna make sure that we've got that shape down of the jawline and that that all makes sense before we start drawing any facial features here. So I was feeling like I had made the head a little short. So I just wanna make sure that I haven't done that. So I'm just double checking going general to specific with the head and we've got plenty of time to make sure things are where they need to be so there's no rush. All right, that's looking pretty good to me so far. And then we need this little shape for the neck. And then I'm gonna go to the black and white version of it so that I can try to find these shapes because it was a little washed out in the inverted version. And now I want to look at these mid-tone values and the, the separation between these shapes. Because again, if I start trying to draw a neck, I'm going to get thrown off psychologically. That's just how I am. And I'm willing to bet y'all are similar. But if we look at the shape of the shadow as a way to guide us, then we can get stay away from getting too attached to anything if it needs to be erased. So we're just matching these shapes. So I'm looking at more detail here at this shape of a shadow. And I'm gonna say it's kind of like a snake head. That's what I'm gonna call it. What I previously described as a boomerang. And it comes out of the bottom of the earlobe. And that's what's telling me where the, the neck is. And then I'm looking at a little bit of the double of the beard shapes here next to the hand. Okay, that's all gonna be a pretty dark shadow when we add the watercolor to it. But I mean, it's not a very dark shadow, but it's gonna be all lumped together, but still just identifying where those shapes are. And again, I drew them really dark so that you could see them and the way I was drawing those shapes, but I want you to draw them really lightly. And the fingertips come right up against all of that. And these circles that we drew were the highlights on the knuckles, right? So we're just gently, lightly with your pencil outlining these shapes that will later be filled in with different values. And if you are not gonna attend the premium class next week and you're gonna just keep going, filling this in with graphite, then you're just gonna fill in your value from light to dark according to the uh, shadowy shapes that you're seeing. Okay, so I erased my vertical and horizontal lines one more time because I just wanna double check them one more time. It's like in a wood shop how you measure twice, cut once, like to measure twice, draw once, or measure three or four times, and then draw. All right, so we want these tops of the eyebrows to be in line with the top of that ear. And then we want the eyes to be right in line with the center of the ear. And then we want the nose to be in line with the middle of our little snake head over here or the uh, center of the, the jaw over here just above. I'm not really describing a good, I'm trying to find a good landmark for where this could be in line with. Um, oh, we could do a, no, I was gonna say connect it to the finger somehow. Well, it's right about here. It's about halfway down. This tells me I need to lengthen my jaw though, paying attention to that. This line coming down from the ear 
needs to be like that. And then the jaw needs to come more like that. And the nose was right in line with the center of that diagonal of the jaw, the top part of the jaw. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. So, and then the center of the lip line is right in line with that corner of the jaw. All right, we're gonna use the lips to help us find the uh, where the eyes are. And also Demetrius has these very dramatic eyebrows that got like a nice little point that come up just at uh, where the, the forehead has a little uh, rounded curve. So that can help us like right here, if we draw another line right here for where the, the high points on the eyebrows are, that can really help. And then we'll find the center of where the pupils go in just a second. I'm gonna go ahead and put these eyebrows in while I'm talking about them. We'll use the eyebrows to help us. Okay, so the eyebrows are still under the top of the, the ear line. So when we talk about facial proportions, I've said a lot of times how the ears are typically tend to be, I always use language like that, like it depends on the person. So it's not like there's a standard for where these things fall on every head, but on Demetrius's head, his uh, top of his eyebrows are in line with the top of his ears at this angle that we're looking at uh, his head. So we've got, we're looking at this line. Whoops. Oh my goodness. That's what I get for trying to swipe on the photographs. So we're looking at this line right here. Okay. And when you outline the head like this, it, it reminds me, it always reminds me of a clown. And then I think, well, yeah, clowns are kind of outlining the bone structure of the face. So it makes sense that we would end up with all these triangles and these straight lines emphasizing these things. So I'm just seeing if I had that little point in the eyebrows where I wanted it to be. And then I'm gonna use that point in the eyebrows to find where the center of the pupils are, like just over from those. Maybe they need to come down a little bit more so that they're more on that line at the center of the ear. And then I'm just looking at the light, what the light is doing here. So the shapes of the shadows and the shapes of the light. And I'm not committing to any of this yet. I'm just still trying to figure out if it's in the right spot. I'm looking for where the center of the pupils are because that's going to help me see if I've got uh, the corners of the mouth in the right spot. And I'm just double checking myself against these connect the dot points. So center of the pupils, top of the eyebrow points, center of the pupils, and then we're looking for the corners of the mouth, which are not quite the corners of the mustache, but we want that to line up and we want it to line up on a slight curve so we don't want it to be a straight line because the head is not a flat surface it's curved so we need a slight curve to all that all right so now still not attached to anything because we haven't even put like the more I look at this I might need to go a little longer with the chin. Let me see if I can, those knuckles really, really make it tricky here on the chin. But I like to draw a little circle on the chin and that helps me see if everything's in the right place. So we can do like a circle on the, highest part of the cheekbones. We can do a circle on the forehead. 
you can do a circle on the tip of the nose. You know, that's what I'm talking about, making it, it feels a little like a clown face, but it, it's really helpful to see if things are in the right place. Okay, now we just got to draw the mustache because the mustache is covering up the top lip and everything. So instead of drawing the top lip, we're going to draw the shape of the mustache. And also we don't need to worry too much. I'm getting kind of caught up in it, but we don't need to worry too much about capturing Demetrius's likeness perfectly. Uh, if we can make it look anywhere near close to a person <laughs> or a head, or if it's a convincing head, let's just be proud of ourselves because we we're running out of time here, honestly. I don't really have the time to try to match up likeness. But what it is, what will help us achieve likeness is getting all these shapes in the right spot. Like, honestly, I want a little more length on this chin because those bottom lips um, take up a lot of space. And I want to be able to get some space right there for the highlight on the bottom lip because that just is going to elevate the drawing to get that in there and also I want some space to get like some of the stubble on the side of the face in there so ideally I probably need to shift my hand down a tiny bit to get the chin to drop down just a tiny bit but I think it's close enough and it's gonna look like a convincing head so we're just gonna go with it I think I might have done a similar thing with the other example too it's just not that noticeable all right, so that's pretty good. Uh, and we've, then we want to erase all of these lines that we put in there to help us find the placement. So all those circles and lines, et cetera. So you could even just like erase the whole thing and then go back in now that you know everything's in roughly the right spot. And then again, we're just looking at the shapes of the shadows and the shapes of the light try to get a little bit of like a space there for reflective light on the eye. Uh, try to get, oh my goodness, kids are getting some sort of update popping up there. All right, and then yeah, the shadow underneath the eyes because of the way the light is hitting his head, having those shadows in there with our blue paint, it's gonna make it more convincing as a head. So again, I'm just drawing the shapes of the shadows and the shapes of the light. They don't need to be this dark. I only drew them that dark so that you could see them. So you wanna erase what is not necessary. So the only thing that really needs to be here for the nose is the nostrils and the shape of the shadow a little bit on the side of the nose. And then underneath the eyes, there's a little bit of a shadow we want to distinguish. And then we want to get the shape of the eyelashes, et cetera. So it's going to look a little, you know, like a paint by numbers there. And then next week, you know, we'll start to fill in our paint by numbers using the different values that we're seeing there. And since all we've got to do in the premium class is now fill in our paint by numbers or our values of one color here, um, I'll really take my time explaining like how to mix up the uh, different values of the, the watercolor paint and how we're going to go about like what number of value we're going to use to fill all those in. Okay, so and sometimes it feels like we're not really capturing that person's likeness too much when we're just doing the empty value shape like that. But just trust, like sometimes when we start to add the dark and the light, like it's really amazing how somebody's likeness could just be. And this is so, you know, dreamy to say, but it could be just the way the light, you know, hits the side of their face or the way the light hits their eyes, you know, it really <laughs> makes a difference. And where the, the dark shadows are on their face really brings a person's likeness to life. So when it's just an empty shape drawing like this, it maybe feels 
uh, you know, don't judge it based on that because we can change a lot of things as we add the, the light and dark values in there. All right, uh, so I'd love to see where you all landed with your, your sketches tonight. And if you wanna just hold them up for our moderator to spotlight and share some of those. Are you able to see it on your end, Adrian? Oh, no, I'm not. Is it spot somebody else yeah. spotlighted for everyone else? I oh, have okay. uh, I need... Sarah's spotlight. OK, I see Sarah's. I just went to the gallery view. I don't know why it wasn't. Maybe I pinned Let me unspotlight and try again. OK, thank you. Yeah, it's always good if I can see who's being spotlighted. All right, how about now? No, I still see me. Ah. But I can see Sarah's, but it's tiny. I could. No. Does everybody else can see? Can somebody put in the chat if you guys can see it spotlit? Yes. Okay. Um, maybe Adrian, if you follow um, host video order, maybe that would work. Oh. Okay, I just removed my spotlight. Try it again. Or maybe Sarah, I can I'll do it one more time. Okay, I think I got it now. Yes, I do. I had pinned myself earlier because I wasn't. Oh, okay. All good. Okay, very nice, Sarah. Yes, that's looking great. I like how you went ahead and started adding some of the shadows in there. That's a great way. Even if you wanted to still do the watercolor class, you could always draw it again. Um, that's a great way to practice and see those shapes. Okay, can you hold it up a little higher so we can see the feet and everything too? All right. Yeah, it's very convincing crouching figure. I love it. Okay, yes. I like the stylized quality that's coming across in all of these. It reminds me of a, a certain illustrator right there. Okay, yes. Very nice, y'all. Oh, was that it? I Anybody believe that was it. Mm -hmm. Okay, from everybody who's volunteering to hold them up. Okay, well, thank you all so much for such a wonderful class and hopefully I will see you uh, next week in the uh, watercolor class where we'll be finishing this project up and Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening.